Anna taking part in tonight's debate. I would like to read you something that Hugo Rifkind wrote in February in The Spectator. It's a clash of worldviews, of rival visions for the urban experience itself, by two men who only need one name each. The rivalry is personal too. They loathe each other and squabble in lifts. <laughs> now, Hugo was writing about Boris and Ken in 2012. But such is the raised profile of this extraordinary campaign that in the last two months, I think this is definitely Sadiq and Zach. Truth is that some issues on which they mirror each other, you might want to go into minutiae, but I really don't think tonight is about the minutiae. Tonight is about the kind of London that you want um, and the kind of London that each man here wants to create. Um, I'm just about to ask them to do uh, two-minute opening statements, uh, but first of all, I'd very much like to thank our sponsors in Midtown and Gatwick. So, I would like, first of all, Zach Goldsmith, please make your opening statement about the vision you have to make London a prosperous and happy capital. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Gatwick. I didn't realize you were tonight's sponsors. <laughs> I'm thrilled. We'd like to give you a head start. <laughs> nice to have a few friends in the room. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. London is booming. Boris Johnson has been a great mayor in my view. He's put London back on the map as the greatest city in the world. But the truth is that there are too many Londoners throughout Greater London who have not felt the benefits of that success. So I'm standing for mayor to protect what we've had under Boris Johnson, but to make it work for Londoners across the board. My action plan for London will deliver more homes to close the gap between demand and supply to help Londoners earning average incomes to get the keys to their own homes. Better transport, that means protecting the transport budget so that we can keep London moving, but also so that we can keep London growing. The safer streets, that means giving the police the tools, the resources and the backing they need to keep us safe. And the environment. I, I want London to be the greenest, the cleanest city on earth. And I'll do it without putting a penny on council tax. I'll do it by working with this government to secure the best possible deal for London. And that matters because London depends almost entirely on central government for its powers and for its funding. I think the choice in this election is clear. If you want to see council tax frozen, if you want to see transport investment protected for the four years to keep London moving and growing, if you want to keep London safe, if you want our precious green spaces protected throughout Greater London, then there is only one sure choice in this election. And I know promises are cheap in the run-up to elections. Politics is a world that is littered with broken promises. But my record as an MP shows that when I make promises, I keep them. When I say I'm going to deliver, I deliver. That I campaign day in, day out on behalf of those who have elected me. That's why I was returned at the last general election with the biggest increased majority of any sitting MP in the country. I want to do, do the same for you as your Mayor of London. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Can. Thanks, uh, Kirsty. I'm running for mayor for one reason, and that's because I want all Londoners to have the opportunities that our great city gave to me. London gave me the helping hand I needed to fulfill my potential and stand before you today. A council home for my parents, which meant they could work hard and save to buy a home of their own. A secure job as a bus driver for my dad a fantastic state school and university education for me and my siblings, and a good quality apprenticeship for my brother. Now, I want all Londoners to get the same opportunities and help in hand to succeed. I'll be the council estate boy who fixes the housing crisis, the bus driver's son who makes commuting more affordable, the businessman who helps our businesses to grow and prosper. And the British Muslim who takes the fight to the extremists and does what's necessary to keep Londoners safe. I want to unite our great city and bring all Londoners together to make London even better. And that's the clear choice at this election. The choice between a united London and a divided one. Between a one London approach with a mayor for all Londoners, 
and a Donald Trump approach with a mayor for just some Londoners. So my message is clear. Choose unity over division. Choose hope over fear. Choose a mayor for all Londoners. Thank you very much. Thank you. just ask a, a, a number of questions. Um, apart from the fact I didn't realise that Zach Goldsmith had a hotel chain. But anyway, um, just coming on, for you, uh, first of all, uh, Sadiq, what is the policy of your opponent that scares you the most? I think it's the tactics that worry me in relation to this election, uh, Kirsty. Can I reassure every Hindu here who's a Londoner, every Sikh is, who is here, every Tamil, your gold will be safe if I become your mayor. <laughs> And can I say to you as a Londoner, I'm not going to make a video with a Bollywood sound over. <laughs> and you know, I do want to be the most pro-business mayor, Kirsty, but I'm not going to use a photograph of me with the Prime Minister of another country to try and attract your vote. I will be a mayor for all Londoners, fixing the housing crisis, making sure we have a modern and affordable transit system, making sure we support businesses to grow and expand, making our city healthy and safe. That's the promise I make as a candidate to be the mayor for all Londoners. But what is, the, what is the policy, I'm going to ask you both this, what is the policy of your opponent that scares you the most? I'm asking for a policy. What is the policy of your opponent that scares you the most? I think, I think if the definition you have of an affordable home is one costing up to £450,000, which is what the Housing and Planning Bill going through the Parliament that Zach voted for will do, the average cost of a starter home, according to Shelter, is £395,000. You need an annual salary of £77,000 plus a deposit of £98,000. This, this is why it scares me. It means my children will never have a chance to have a home in London. Right. Before I, before I ask uh, Zach about what policy of yours scares him, answer that point. Is an affordable home, is an affordable home £450,000? Of course not, and I have never said. We've had this argument so many times. Well, let's and, not have that again. Then. So I'm sure we'll come to housing. <laughs> um, it, it is the opposite of the truth, and it's the opposite of what I said. I, I, we, we have a scheme called Starter Homes. I think it's a very good scheme. It has helped thousands upon thousands of people to get the keys to their first home, people who otherwise would not have been able to. The cap that has been set by government for a starter home is 450. Is that too high? But it is, is too it, high. It is too it, high. It, it is you disagree with the policy. Four, no, I think the scheme is a very, very good scheme. I have met hundreds of people who've got the keys to their first home on the back of that policy and the London Health to But is £450,000 too high? It, it's, it's probably about the right place for a cap, but it is not the average, right. it is the cap. And there are, there are starter homes across London at about £160,000, £180,000, £220,000, homes that I've been to visit in Ealing. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's okay, you'll be able to get there because it'll take you so long, you'll be able to go overnight on the tube from October. <laughs> no, cap, Ealing, Ealing, uh, uh, pocket, pocket <laughs> housing in... Anyway, let's okay. go. What is, the, what is the policy of your opponent that scares you the most, Zach? Well, I, I'm going to start with the approach. Um, I'm not going to answer the points that Sadie made, because I'm, I'm sure we will come to those issues during the course we of will, this debate. So, the, I think the, the biggest risk to London from Sadiq Khan, I think, is his unwillingness to talk to government. London depends almost completely on government. Unlike New York, where, which generates huge wealth and has 50% to the central government and holds on to 50% and is largely self-sufficient, in London, we hand 93% of the taxes we raise to government. We then have to go to the Chancellor and beg for some of that back to pay for our police, to pay for our tubes, to pay for the things that we need in London. If you're not willing to talk to government, if you're not willing to engage with the but, government, you can't deliver a good but deal. Presumably, that proportion, but presumably, you don't think that proportion is the right proportion. I don't. I think it's a weakness, but it is a fact. That's where we no, are. But presumably, I, you, if you were, you would it, try and offer that. As, as an MP, let alone as a candidate for mayor, I have been lobbying for devolution. But the fact remains that today, London depends on government for almost everything. We've had bills that affect London directly going through Parliament in the last six months, which have, in some cases, threatened uh, London. And yet, Sadiq Khan has been nowhere to see in a okay. billion pound threat. Can I say, uh, 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 you, you, the, the reality is. The reality is. Is it, is, is is it, it important to you to talk to government? Absolutely. Look, if, if, if working with the government 
means towing the party line to support a cruel budget. Of it no, thank you. Well, if, 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 working, if, working, if working with the government means voting for cuts of £600 million to the Met Police budget, no thank you. I talk to the government all the time. Uh, when I was a minister in government, I worked with a Tory mayor, for example, on Crossrail for example, on a permit scheme to stop utilities digging up our, our roads, for example, on the Oyster card going to overground. Members of the government sponsored me to run the London Marathon, and uh, members of the senior members of the How Tory party... How did you do? How uh, did you do? Four hours and 19, raising more than £20,000 for the dispossessed fund. <laughs> That's very good. Well, but you know what else? The yeah. else, Kirsty, senior members of the Tory party talk to me now and say they're disgusted with Zach Goldsmith's campaign. That's not true. Uh, well, well, I, I think, I, I think you, you shouldn't really throw things out with that if you're not prepared to name I, people. I, um, I take my hat off to you on your achievements of the marathon, but the truth is that we have had in the last few months, and I couldn't compete with that, I'm afraid. A few months ago, there was a threat of a billion pound cut to the Met Police. It would have been devastating. I teamed up with Conservative members, with Boris Johnson as well. We went to the Chancellor, we went to the Home Secretary, we won the arguments, and the budget was ring-fenced. You know, there was a yeah, real threat. You know, How many look, times did you try and talk to the Chancellor? How many times did you even knock on the door of the Home Secretary? In, I can in, did you question. go to number 11? Not once. In, not once. <laughs> you, you would have... In, in the heat and noise of an, ele an election, you get this silliness. Look, a Tory government is giving a Scottish Parliament more powers, SNP government. A Tory government is giving the Welsh Assembly more powers, a Tory mayor. A Tory government, for goodness sake, is giving Greater Manchester more powers, Labour Greater Manchester, always has been, probably always will be. And I'm sure George Osborne, David Cameron, are going to cut their nose to spite their face. They will talk to the Mayor of London because he or she is... Let me give you an example of how we're going to work together. Should I have the privilege of being the Mayor of London, on May the 6th, I will start working with David Cameron, George Osborne, Sajid Javed and others to keep our country in the European Union. It's good for London and it's good for our we're country. We're going to come on to that anyway. Right. Um, Zach Goldsmith, what is the most unequal thing about London? The most unequal thing? Uh, look, the biggest problem in London and the biggest challenge for the next man is housing. We have a situation today where, unless you're already in the housing market, it is almost impossible to get your foot on the ladder. It's almost impossible. You could be earning the average London salary, 34,500. You could be earning double that salary, and you're still going to struggle. So unless you are already in that market, unless you already have a home, you have effectively been locked out. And that is the biggest challenge of the next mayor. That's why we need to build around 50,000 homes a year. If we don't, then London will cease to be the most important, the most dynamic city in the world. So I think that probably... Right, it's certainly the biggest challenge, and I think it's the biggest job of the next mayor. What and is the most the unequal after. thing that you think in London? Uh, housing's a big issue, but Kirsty, I mean, we've had a Conservative mayor for the last eight years and a Tory Prime Minister for the last six. You know, we've got, we're in a city where you've got 400 billionaires, 400,000 millionaires. Yet last year, more than 100,000 Londoners used a food bank. And one of the reasons why, uh, you know, uh, rough soup has more than doubled over the last eight years uh, of the last year, it's gone up by more than 37%, is we have a housing crisis in London. And I call it a Tory housing crisis, because there's no point building homes in London if before they've been completed, they're sold to investors in the Middle East and Asia. We shouldn't be embarrassed <laughs> of saying... We shouldn't be embarrassed... Wait, 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 wait. Are you suggesting that you would put a bar on the amount of foreign ownership of London property? You do, and new homes, yes. Let, let me explain how we do it. So and we, already, we already have some Labour councils having as a condition of, give, of getting permission, you've got to market the property yeah. in London for six months first. But that's different from saying, let me see your passport, you're not getting the house. Oh, no, but you, but look, we, 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 did some, we did some work, and we found one top five estate agent who last year marketed 7,000 properties overseas before they'd been mm. completed in London. Another one had 50 cocktail parties in the Mandarin Hotel in Singapore and Hong Kong last year selling properties. I would say, when it comes to homes built on public land, they've got to be available for Londoners to buy or rent. When it comes to getting permission on uh, homes on private land, the expectation is most of them, uh, there should be a, a first dibs for Londoners. Hackney Council, for example, on one of their pieces of land, said to the developer, you've got permission, 
We want them to be affordable homes on this land, but you've got to market in Hackney first for the first six months before you can market overseas. First Do you agree with that, Zach Goldsmith? Yeah, in my manifesto, my action plan for London, I'm committing that new homes built on publicly owned land will be for Londoners. Along the lines of the Hackney model, it's had it, not quite as prescriptive, yeah. but along the lines of what Hackney have done with pocket housing, which provide homes for about <laughs> £160,000 starter homes, for the record. Um, it is a, it is some, there is no point building a lot of homes on publicly owned land, on land that we own, if those homes are bought up and left empty it causes massive resentment and it doesn't contribute to solving the problem. So we can do that, but it's harder to be prescriptive on private development on private land. You can delay marketing, but you can't mandate. Would, would you like to see, Zach, um, financial services becoming less important to the London economy? I, I would not like them to be any less important than they are today, but I would like to see other sectors catch up. I want a diverse economy. And the truth is that over the last 10 years, that has happened. We are now flourishing in so many different sectors of human endeavor. Our, 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 our media sector generates more TV, almost as much TV content as LA. Our, we are the most Googled city in the world for culture. But, but our tech sector didn't even exist 10 years ago. It's now one of the biggest in the world. We dominate the world in fintech. That is a good thing. I don't want any of our sectors to be, uh, to be, to be deflated, but I'd like and to And you don't worry about, you don't worry about uh, global financial, financial institutions after a referendum vote upping sticks and going to some other European capital? No, I look, the, the, the business world, like I'm imagining this office, like my party, like every party, like the British people, do, does not speak with one voice on Europe. I have to tell you, I'm not campaigning on Europe because I, I regard the 5th of May to be a much bigger decision for Londoners, and I'm solely occupied on that. It's also the case... <laughs> that, it, it's also the case that the, the, the next mayor of London will not have the job of taking us out of Europe or keeping us in Europe. The next Mayor of London's job will be to make work whatever the British people decide in a long overdue referendum. That's the job of the next Mayor, and I put myself forward as someone who will do that job by working with government, by delivering my action plan for Greater London. But as an individual, as one of the 48 million people who I hope will take part in mm -hmm. this hugely important referendum, just a few weeks after the mayoral election, I will be voting to come out, and I'll vote up to come out because I think that's where, but, on but, balance... But, but, uh, but, uh, you absolutely, you say you're campaigning campaigning to be the next London mayor, mm. but do you think that a vote to leave will have an impact on financial institutions in London? Globe, I'm just asking, do you, you think you it will have an impact? You can't say that it won't have an impact on any sector, of course, staying in coming out, whatever decision is taken will have an impact. There's no, there, it's not status quo versus coming out of Europe. There is no status quo. The European Union, the Eurozone particularly, is moving rapidly in a particular direction. It is becoming more and more like an individual nation with a single set of governance. We're not going to be part of that, even if we vote to stay in. So the choice we're making is, do we want to be on the edge of something changing very rapidly over which we have no control, okay. or do we want to stand on our own feet? On balance, I wouldn't pretend it's a black and white issue, but on balance, so I believe that we have a better future out. If you became London Mayor, if you became London Mayor, would you be concerned about, you know, the, the whole question of passporting, that global financial institutions who headquarter in London would simply move to Paris or, I don't know, Frankfurt, somewhere else, they would go or say, do you have a concern about that? Yes, I have a concern as a Londoner about us leaving the European Union. As the Mayor of London, you have a leadership role especially if you're going to be a pro-business mayor. More than 500,000 jobs in London are directly dependent on us being members of the European Union. 60% of the world's leading companies who have a European headquarters have them here in London. Think of Sony, AIG Insurance, China Telecom. Half of London's exports go to the European Union. When you speak to chief executives, uh, financial directors, people in the city of London, they want the mayor to be a champion for London. That includes, for example, having influence in Brussels, but also in Westminster, and I will be that champion both between May the 6th and June the 23rd, but also after that as well, bringing businesses to uh, London, building on Boris Johnson's trade missions, getting businesses to come into London, and if we're not in the European Union, a market of 500 million, a GDP bigger than China and USA, how is that being pro-business? So, let's say you do win and Britain votes to leave, what are you going to do? Well, obviously, obviously it'll, be, it'll be a challenge for our city. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if that can answer, for example, how long before the first bilateral trade agreements are signed up. Will they be done 
before we've well, left Canada, the EU. Well, I know Canada's taking quite well. Uh, Zach, just very quickly on that. I know you're talking about the fact that you, mm. this is about the mayoral election, and indeed it is. But your attitude towards business and the city is very important. Yeah, absolutely right. But I don't, for every James Dyson, there is a Richard Branson. For every Mitsubishi, there's a Tate and Lyle. For every CBI, there's a FSB. A business does not speak with one voice. It is not, I would not put myself, put this argument forward as a, a straight choice between risk and a risk-free no. option of staying in Europe. I don't believe either option is risk-free, and I think it's naive to pretend either option is risk-free. But right. I think on balance, we are better off being in a political environment in which the people who make decisions on our behalf can be booted out, and that is not the case today. I think that's a problem. Okay, well, let's let's um, let's look at um, let's look at what you think are the key attributes of London that make it a truly global city. Zach. I mean, London is one of the most diverse cities on earth, and, and we are lucky in London that unlike other great cities in the world, like Paris, for example, beautiful architecturally, magnificent city, extraordinary history, we are, broadly speaking, a harmonious city. We have this patchwork of different uh, uh, cultures and religions, and they get on, and that is something we shouldn't take for granted. That is something that the mayor and all representatives across London need to do everything they possibly can to protect. I think that is one of London's greatest str strengths. It's not our only strength. There are things which are hard to quantify. There is an energy in London. There's a dynamism in London. There's an entrepreneurial spirit in London. London is a place where people have opportunities, but we've got to maintain that, and we won't. If and, we don't. and you want that to be a place for people to, of all faiths and none to Absolutely feel equal. Right. So, uh, is there an issue, which there clearly is in some people's minds, with integration? Is there an issue with yes. integration? Of course, there will always be an issue with integration. It is uh, essential that different groups within London learn to integrate as much as possible. That doesn't mean creating a homogenous London. The last thing we want is a homogenous London. One of the great joys for me in this campaign has been going with friends to their communities, taking part in festivals that I've not taken part in before, and seeing people maintaining and nourishing and enjoying and reveling in their own cultural identity. This sort of dual identity, and it works. And it works, broadly speaking, across London. I don't want everyone to be the same in London, but integration is absolutely essential. And some communities are better at integration than others. And quite often that's, that's based upon how long they have been here. The Jewish community, for example, has been here quite a long time, I think is, is pretty effectively integrated. There are new uh, 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 cultures emerging, new groups emerging in London that are beginning that process. Sadiq Khan, what about integration? And, I mean, obviously it, the whole questions of uh, ethnicity and so forth have played a part in this campaign. We've been a city open to people, trade and ideas for a thousand years. One of the joys of London is our diversity. Tessa Jowell tells a great story when we were bidding for the Olympics. First, New York was talking about its diversity because there are more than 200 languages spoken there. Then they realized in London we had more than 300 and soon changed that tack. We know when the contest hosts, hosts the Olympics in 2012. One of the great things about London, Kirsty, is we have multiple identities. You can be a Londoner, European, British, English, of Islamic faith, of Asian origin, of Pakistani heritage, a father, uh, a, a husband, a long-suffering Liverpool fan. All these things are part and parcel of uh, who we are. But the great thing is this, we don't simply tolerate uh, difference, we respect it and we celebrate it. But here's the challenge. The challenge is we've got to make sure that people uh, speak to each other. They work together, they study together, they play together. And, you know, for a thousand years we've just, uh, we've, we've worked at it. And sometimes politicians have had a hands-off approach. Sometimes you've got to get involved in ensuring that people integrate, especially if there are issues around segregation, uh, which is why, for example, I've, I'm a big advocate of people speaking English. I think there's nothing wrong in saying, look, you know, if you're going to get to know your neighbours, if you're going to speak to teachers at your children's schools, if you're going to apply for a job, learning English is quite important, which is why, you know, I think, you know, uh, the, for the government to cut the funding to FE colleges to learn English is, is a backward step, and I'd be encouraging people to speak English. You know, what, what, you know, here we are in our, our august surroundings, and you're an august crowd, and by and large, you're well behaved. Uh, but parts of this campaign have not been very well behaved, and in a way, it's been, in a way, very strange to watch and listen to both of you actually throwing a bit of mud at each other, there's been accusations of racism, there's been accusations of not being hard enough in extremism. Do you both regret that? Looking at me? Yeah, both of you. I, um, <laughs> I, um, it's, 
I, I can't see your eyes with oh, the lights sorry, sorry. bouncing off. You. If you point, it will um, look, I, I, of course, look, no one wants a no one wants a negative campaign. I, I have I have had a um, I, I have never had a, a, a political campaign that has been anything other than entirely positive. My campaign, except in, for this one. Well, no, except no, for this one. No, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely right. My, and, and my campaign in this election has been overwhelmingly positive. The, the, the string, the thread, the thread that has run through every piece of literature that I have put out, every piece of communication has been, has been about my action plan for Greater London and how I will deliver that action plan. That has been my central message. You're about to interrupt me. I can no, tell. I'm, I want you to carry yeah. on. But, but there, there are issues. There are issues. And there are issues that I've raised. There are issues that Londoners have raised, that social, raised on social media, raised by most of the newspapers in this country that question not Sadiq Khan's views, but his judgment. And I think they're legitimate. I think for someone who wants to stand as mayor of London, someone... For someone who wants to stand as mayor of London, the greatest city in the world, for someone who will then have, if they're elected on the 5th of May, a serious security remit, keeping London safe is a really important part of, of being the mayor of London. You can't expect then people not to scrutinize your extensive links with people who mean to do this city harm. It's just naive to imagine right. to those okay. questions. Well, listen. And, 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 I'd like to get this nailed properly so, so we can either get move on or get an apologies from both of you or whatever. Can you respond can, can, to that, Sadiq? Can, 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 can I just ask a simple question, Zach? Can you tell me what power I, as mayor, would have that would put the jewellery of Hindus at risk? But this is a separate issue, and I've never suggested that you're going to put Hindus' jewellery at risk. That is a, a labour made up story. No, that's not true. You obviously haven't read the leaflet. It, at, at no point has anyone... But are in you saying... I'm, I'm going to this put this straight to Sadiq. I'm going to put this straight to Sadiq Khan. Are you saying that there is something in Sadiq's life or in his past that makes you think that the security of London will be in some way less secure and threatened in Sadiq Khan's hands? Uh, right, yes or no, and then I must put that well, straight to Sadiq. I'm not going to give you a yes or no. Okay. I'm going to say that judgment matters. I'm going to say that we are engaged in an what idea... What makes your judgment better we, than we, this? We, I, I don't give platforms and cover and oxygen to people who mean to do this city and this country home. Right. I never okay. have, yeah. and I never would. Um, I, Can you please answer that point? I've spent my entire life fighting extremism. I'm the only candidate who, when he stood for Parliament in 2005, had extremists outside a place where I've worshipped most of my life saying that I was an apostate destined to go to hell. Anybody who voted for me was also going to go to hell as a consequence. I'm the only candidate who, when he voted for same-sex marriage, had a fatwa put out against him uh, and had to discuss with his daughters police protection. There are still people in Tutin today who don't talk to me because I voted for same-sex marriage. And why did I do it? Because I spent my entire life fighting inequality and, and injustice. You, well, so therefore... And I've got to tell you this, and I've got to tell you this, and I've got to tell you this, okay. I've got to tell you this. More than half of the Conservative Party in Parliament didn't vote for same-sex okay. marriage. And, and, I, and, and I had, I had fatwas against me, imams okay. against me, the community against okay. me, and I okay. did. Right, here's two things. First of all, in order to be a good Londoner, do you think you have to believe that there is absolutely nothing wrong with homosexuality? Do you have to believe that there is equality of gender? Is that what you need to believe to be a good Londoner? No, we're talking about extreme... I mean, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, but this is the, the point, point you're the, saying. The, you're the, saying the, that you had a fatwa against you because... Point, the, the point I'm making is I, I clearly haven't got extreme views, right? Because, because so, I'm the person that is standing up to the extremists. I'm the person that discusses police protection with his daughters. I'm because, the person that has people different. not speaking to me. I want to make a point. No, no one, no one's serious, maybe on Twitter where odd things happen, but no one's serious has suggested that you do have extreme no. views. As far as I'm aware, I certainly haven't. My camp, no one associated with my campaign or my party have suggested or have, suge have suggested that Sadiq Khan have suggested that Sadiq Khan extreme, has extreme views. But, what, but can anyone honestly tell me, honestly, Sadiq Khan, can you honestly tell me that it is not legitimate for people to ask about your having shared platforms with 15, Kirstie, 20 people Kirstie, look. over and over again? Okay. Okay. And, and, let me finish. And, not, and not having challenged them, not only not having okay, challenged them, but having, about the having challenge. defended their, let, let, their extreme just, remarks. I, say, well, I want to talk about one thing that's been raised, and I, and I think this is a, 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 an interesting thing from the point of view just of, of dynamics. 
there were, there were questions raised over your former brother-in-law's attitudes. When he was in the family, because this is how, you know, people are very concerned about, you know, of all faiths and none, about people in the family behaving not a way that you would like. Did you challenge him? Well, yes, but by the way, I hope we're going to discuss his family yes, as well. Yes, fine, fine, right? yes. <laughs> because, you know... Yes. What's, uh, feel, uh, so and, by, and by the way, and by the way, and by the way, answered, and do you feel free and to and answer Zach and, by, and ask Zach and a by, question of his family? And, and by the way, my ex-brother-in-law, who I've not seen in 12 years, ain't endorsing me. Yeah. But, but, so, if you answer but, that but point... Let, let, let me deal with this. My, my, my ex-brother-in-law, who I've not seen in 12 years, at least, uh, had divorced my sister a number of years ago, gave an interview uh, earlier on this week, and you can see the, the words he used to describe me. He also made the point which is I didn't go to, and it, it broke my heart, both my niece's weddings, uh, who I love and adore, uh, as a consequence of the fact that their father may well have uh, been there. So with the greatest respect, I don't need Zach lecturing me about extremism. Do you... Look, I think the point... I think the point, and I'm going to come to... You can ask, think of your question for Zach's family in a minute, but... I, well, the, what, no, no, but I'm not going to do that, because that, that's not what I want to do. It isn't about his family... Or his parents, you, but, or his when, bank account. When he was, all I'm saying is, <laughs> when he was in your family, before he divorced your sister, di all I'm asking is, did you challenge him on his views? That's all, that's all I'm asking. And, and four minutes ago, I said yes. Good, great. Right, and no questions for Zach's family. Right. No. In that but, case, let's move on to very, very important matters. Would it have a deleterious impact or not on London if every secondary school was an academy with no local authority involvement. Zach. I, I have to start by saying this is not a mayoral policy. We can make all kinds of pronouncements about academies, but it's not something the mayor has any direct control of. Um, I believe that the academy process, I'm going to answer the question, but yeah. I just want to make it clear this is, this is not something over which either of us will have any control of. No, but you know but, what? There's a lot but, of kids being educated in London, yeah. and you kind of need absolutely to... Right. So, absolutely right, but we don't have control over that policy. The mayor does not have control. The mayor's job is to ensure we have school places. That is something that the mayor can do, and the mayor presides over a lot of publicly owned land, and we'll have to make sure that as that land is developed, enough place is left aside for schools to be built or schools to be extended that is something the mayor has direct authority over. Uh, in answer to your question, I think the academy program has been a good thing. I've seen it in my own constituency. I think it has been a real success. I question whether or not this needs to be mandated across the whole country. I don't see the upside in doing that. And I can see that there are a lot of jitters among parents uh, of school children and also teachers about going down that extra path. But uh, the program itself, I think, is a good thing, and I'm very pleased to support it, as I have done in Parliament. The most stressful time of the year for most parents is March and April in London mm -hmm. because they're waiting to see whether young Johnny or young Ali gets into the local state school. It is a stressful time. The mayor should have powers in relation to school planning. And I'll be lobbying the government to have those powers. But let me tell you the other reason why it's important for Londoners. Once an asset, which is what school property is, is handed over to become an academy, that asset can be treated how the academy wants to treat it. It can be sold off including school playing fields, and it, you can change the admissions policy and do all sorts of other things. And the reason why the mayor has a role in this is because you've got to think about how London works. Will people live? Will people work? Will people study? Will people play? And the connectivity. So, for example, when it comes to a, a permission being given for lots of homes, the mayor should be talking about, will there be a school place, will there be schools there? Will there be a GP practice uh, uh, there? What about, the, the, what about the mayor working with local authorities, working with experts and parents to lobby the government to expand schools and open new schools in areas where you need new schools, which currently doesn't happen? What's happening now is where there's a surplus of school places, mm -hmm. you get uh, local parents lobbying the government for a new free school, and where there's a need for additional places, because the parents may or not be organised, there's no coordination, it's not happening. I think the mayor should be saying something about this if he, want, or if he wants to be mayor for all Londoners. So, I mean, do you think... Uh, is a case for a local authority involvement for the very thing about coordination? Yeah, look, the, you're talking about the soft power of the platform that the, of, of, that the mayoralty provides. And, and that, the answer is true for everything. We don't have direct, we, we would not have direct control over mental health. But clearly, there is a, a shortage, an acute shortage of beds, and the mayor's job is to lobby for enough provision. The same is true for NHS funding. The same is true across the board. But, and if there is a shortage of school places, which in some parts of London there is, I, it's not acute yet, but it's not far away from being acute. And, and on this point, we will agree. I've had a number of letters today, even from my 
my own constituents worrying about the fact that they can't get their kids into the school of choice. This is a worrying time for parents. The mayor's job is to lobby, to ensure that the government provides what is needed in order to, to ensure that we don't have a school's places crisis. But where the mayor has direct control is over public land, mayoral controlled land. And that's where you just have to ensure through the London plan that we don't build tens of thousands of new homes in areas without also providing what those homes are going to need. GP practices and high streets as well. It's not just about hospitals and, and schools. It's about high streets. It's about a, a communities. We don't want to create units of accommodation. We want to create mixed communities. Ten minutes from me and then it's half an hour from the audience. So, um, what can you do for London that's as big as the Olympics? Sadiq Khan. Homes for Londoners is uh, what I want to set up, uh, which I'll be in charge of. We'll bring together local authorities, bring together uh, house associations, bring together developers, bring together those with finance, so we can collect land and finance to build the genuinely affordable homes Londoners need to rent and to buy. It's going to be uh, a big, big uh, task. We've got to start uh, and have that sort of... But Daniel Craig attitude. won't be there in the middle of the audience. We want some excitement. You know, one of, one, of the, one of the best things Boris Johnson did was in 2012 be an advocate uh, and, you know, he spoke for all of London. But for the other seven and a half years, he's let London down. Now, my point is this. You can have great events like the Olympics and they are crucial. But what I'd rather do is sort the bread and butter stuff out. Right. Housing, a modern forward public transport system, uh, a city that's uh, safe and uh, healthy, supporting businesses yeah. to grow and expand, a, a London where Londoners get the opportunities that I had. Jack Goldsmith. It, it's not about a one-off flag-waving moment. We have a housing crisis. I'm excited about delivering those 50,000 homes, not just to solve the crisis, but to show that you can build those 50,000 homes in a way that actually enhances existing communities. I don't want us to repeat the mistakes we've made over, over the last 20, 30 years, building alienating tower blocks in inappropriate areas against the wishes of the local community. I'm excited about building 50,000 homes in a way that enhances and improves communities without compromising our green spaces. And I'm excited about getting into the communities to begin preventing crime. It's not all about police and guns and stop and search. Uh, one of the great joys for me of this campaign has been meeting people on the front line who on minuscule resources are steering hundreds and hundreds of kids away from making the wrong choices. It seems to me that that's something that the mayor, through MOPAC, should be actively backing. I think that lifts the opportunities of vast numbers of people who don't have opportunities and it makes London safer and it probably saves us an absolute fortune as well. Now... Uh, you both say that you want to increase the cultural involvement of Londoners in London. Um, what was the last cultural event you were at? Sadiq Khan. Oh, uh, the Vogue 100 at the National Portrait. Um, I watched Amateur Boxing two weeks ago at the Troxy. Uh, I watched Batman vs Superman. <laughs> Don't recommend it. Right. Um, Zach, last cultural event you went to see, last piece of theatre perhaps? I mean, if, if you're talking in campaign terms, I've been to cultural events pretty much every day. Um, so it, I've been to Gurdwara's in Southall, I've been to the Wheelsden Temple, I'm going to Neeson tomorrow night. I, every day is a cultural journey. As yeah, part but that's of this on this two months. I, is every day well, a cultural two months. journey so when you're been, not believe on the it or not, Believe it or not, we've been at this for about 260 days now. Outside of the campaign, I don't believe either of us can honestly tell you we have a life. I've got a three-month-old son I haven't met yet. Um, <laughs> it is a, this is a, a very, very intensive campaign. Outside of that, the most enjoyable uh, uh, cultural event, if I can call it that, that I've been to was, was probably my two-year-old daughter's school play in which she was hopeless, but it was a wonderful thing. You know? Just a couple more. Um, now, we, we, we all know that Westminster itself is actually crumbling, and at some point, you at some Parliament. point, yep, some point, yeah. Parliament's going to have to get out the chamber or else there's going to be real problems. Would you be happy to see Parliament perhaps going to Birmingham for a while or Manchester if necessary? Zach? Uh, look, I wouldn't back that. We're, this is a capital city and, and it's, I'm, we're going to fall out over this, I can tell. I think Parliament should remain here. This is a capital city. It's not just the most important city in the country. It's the most important city in the world. It makes sense that Parliament should be here. And I, I really would strongly resist moves which seem to be growing worryingly to, uh, I uh, don't mean forever, I mean temporarily. Well, well actually, there's a ca there is a growing campaign suggesting that Parliament should become a museum, but I think that would be a tragedy. I, I have school kids from my constituency going to Parliament almost every day, 
and they see democracy in action, and it's an extraordinary thing. I walked with three kids who were lobbying me from Kingston. They came, I forget what they were lobbying me about. We walked down the corridors. <laughs> and it was very good, but, but I'll tell you, you'll, you'll understand why I forgot what they're lobbying me about. By, we were walking down the corridor to the meeting room, and we passed the Prime Minister, and it, it is what happens if you're an MP. You don't think twice about it, but I saw their faces, and I thought, how many democracies in the world is it possible for three teenage kids to just randomly bump into the Prime Minister in the corridors of power? It's an extraordinary thing, and I don't want that to change. Well, we're, we're going to have to get... You are literally going to have to get out of the chamber at some point. So Simple. would you be in favour of going to the East End or perhaps going to Newcastle for a while? I mean, would it be a problem if Parliament left London for a couple of years? Well, it's, le it's left Parliament before, during the Second World War, of course. Yeah. But, but the reason why London is, is uh, unique is because we aren't simply the uh, political capital of our country, we're the financial capital and the cultural uh, capital. And I think that's a strength to London. And I, I, I understand why you asked the question, but, you know, it, it's the same goes with London having more power, power over our city. Look, my argument isn't give us a bigger slice of the cake. My argument is give London more control over our city we can make the cake bigger. And I think having politicians in London is a huge strength, not simply because the civil service is there, but because it's a capital city and it makes uh, decision-making far, far easier. So temporarily, it might be interesting taking politicians out of Parliament. There was, a, I think, the mayor of um, Lisbon uh, moved City Hall out of where it was in the plush area to a deprived part of Lisbon, and it regenerated uh, the city is one Portuguese uh, city, so, and you know, famously in New York, mm -hmm. once the Clinton Foundation opened the office in Harlem, it completely regenerated the area. So there are things we can do to regenerate parts of London. TfL is going to Stratford, which will have a big impact in relation to, uh, uh, hopefully, the Stratford economy. So there are things we can do to make sure all of London prospers uh, from the wealth. One of the things I want to do is have uh, a London uh, a, a capital, of, a London borough of culture, just like with the European City of Culture, where cities bid to be the European City of Culture. Imagine if boroughs bid to be the London Borough of Culture. We could have artists from the Royal Opera House, English National Ballet, uh, go into the boroughs across London so they could see the benefits and the joys of the, the crown jewels that are in London. So, uh, one final one from me before we go out to the floor. Um, what would your style of leadership be like? Sadiq Khan. Uh, I believe in crowdsourcing, not just uh, funding my campaign. Uh, but crowdsourcing uh, ideas. So what I want to do is change the culture of our city. If you go to Paris, for example, uh, or, or, or you know, Seoul, what the mayors there have done is give people more control over how money is spent in their city. And I want, people, I want to crowdsource ideas in relation to, for example, how do we solve the problems of the environment, travelling around our city? Uh, what, who is the modern basil jet who's going to solve the problems of our city now? So my style of leadership will be one where Londoners feel they've got a stake in our city, and I want to get involved in some of the solutions to the challenges uh, we face. Zach. Um, I, I, don't believe, um, I don't believe in micromanagement, and I don't believe that politicians are always the best people to deliver solutions. Um, I've discovered over the last few months organizations I'd never heard of that are doing unbelievably impressive work. And I know that if I'm elected mayor of London, in just two weeks' time. I won't be able to solve all of London's problems without tapping into those organizations that are doing extraordinary work. The St. Giles' Trust is doing extraordinary work steering kids away from crime. QPR, Loftus Road, for those wondering. Uh, QPR <laughs> is, uh, is doing an extraordinary job uh, with uh, identifying kids most at risk of falling into trouble. Uh, the last crop of kids they took on, not one of them was excluded from school. Every single one of them exceeded their, their peers in terms of GS GCSE results. The, the local authorities can't do that. Uh, schools can't do that. But these organizations are well-placed to do that. So I will place, I will back those organizations and those people doing good work. I'll do everything I can using every lever the mayoralty provides in order to support the, the big society, a concept which was abandoned about five years ago, but which is oh, very, very society. meaningful. Oh, the big society, what happened? I'm going to bring it back. Bring back the big society. Right. Now, I'd like to uh, begin our audience participation, please. Lots of hands up. But the first question I'm going to take is from our sponsor tonight, one of our sponsors, uh, and she is Tass Mavrogard Gordato, and she is the chief executive of In Midtown. Now, your question, please. Thank you. Uh, the Midtown commercial district is home to Bloomsbury, Holborn, and St. Giles. The private sector is currently investing huge amounts of money into the district that's becoming a major commercial centre for London. We're also anticipating over the next 10 to 15 years a 50% increase in footfall 
mm. from our visitors to the district. Um, and really, we want to know how you're going to make sure that the investment and funding for Transport for London is secure to make sure that the upgrades for tube stations such as Holborn and other key central London stations get their capacity upgrades that they actually need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zach. Uh, first of all, thank you for sponsoring this evening. Um, I, I am committed to protecting the Transport for London budget. Um, that is front and foremost in my uh, action plan for London. And the reason I protect that budget is because if I don't, there's no way we can continue with the vital upgrades that we know London needs in order just to keep moving. Our population is growing by 100,000 every year. Uh, it, people are moving further and further away from the centre because the costs uh, are so high in central London. London needs to keep moving. So protecting that budget will enable us to add about a third additional capacity to some of the key tube lines. It will allow us to grow the network. The Sutton tram link, for example, uh, will cost about £200 million. Pounds. But, but even more important than keeping London moving, essential though that is, it is a fact that if we don't grow the transport network, we don't solve the housing crisis. Crossrail 2 will deliver 200 thousand homes. It's not just a transport issue, it's a regeneration issue. The Sutton tram link I just mentioned, 200 billion pounds to, to, to construct, will enable us to build 20,000 homes that otherwise wouldn't be built. The, the uh, overground extension to Barking Riverside, 26,000 homes that otherwise wouldn't be built, and on and on and on. Growing the transport network is the most important thing the next mayor must do in order to keep London moving and in order to keep London growing. And that's why Sadiq Khan's flagship proposal, uh, his fair freeze for four years, I think is so irresponsible. It would take nearly two billion pounds out of the budget. We would take nearly two billion pounds, 1.9 billion pounds out of the transport budget. And yes, of course, you can do that. You can freeze fares. You can take 1.9 billion out of the budget. But you can't do that and also grow the network. And I think for, for commuters, it will be hell. Right. Sadiq can. Hang on, hang on, Sadiq. Hang on, sorry. Wherever the microphone person is at the top, will you give it to the gentleman with the dark uh, jumper on, please, at the front. He's had his hand up for ages. Sorry, Sadiq. Uh, so, look, fares have gone through the roof over the last eight years. We pay the most expensive fares in all of Europe, uh, and I'm going to freeze fares over the next four years. It won't cost £1.9 billion, it will cost uh, far less, £450 million. We've got a fully funded package. How are we going to uh, freeze that? So, the key issues in relationship, and I, my, my business was in Museum Street, uh, so I know the area pretty well. The good news is, uh, Crossrail 1 will open in 2018, the station near you. Uh, Tottenham Court Road, and 2019, the rest of Crossroad 1 will open up. But we need to increase, you're right, the infrastructure in London. We've got a, a rising population, currently 8.6 million, going to 9 million in 2020, 10 million in uh, 2030. We now need to be talking about and getting going with Crossroad 2. We can't wait any longer. No more dither or delay from the government. Crossroad 1 goes from east to west. We need Crossroad 2 going from southwest to northeast. We've got to make it safer and easier for people to cycle around our city. Uh, that, means, that means, you know, that means build, build, building on the work both Boris Johnson and Ken Livingston uh, did. We need more cross crossings on the east of our city. Uh, if you stand on Tower Bridge and look east, there's one. Look west, there's more than 18. We've got to extend the DLR. We've got to extend the Baikulu line. As far as TfL is concerned, TfL is good, but it's flabby. It's got a budget annually of £12 billion a year. We've got to make it more efficient cut waste and make sure we increase the revenue streams of uh, TfL. I've got the experience as a former minister and in charge of big projects yeah. to do that. Yeah. I'm just going to take your question. Can I just have a very, very quick, a tiny question as a, a, an outsider? Why in London, when these Boris bikes get rented out, don't you have to everybody wear a helmet? It's I think, unbelievable. I think, I think the, the reason is there's work done. If you were to require people to wear helmets, it might lead to less people cycling. Of course, people should wear helmets if they can, but what you want to do is encourage people to cycle rather than giving people another reason not to cycle. Well, I think accidents might be a reason. I, I just got to say, I agree with all the things that, that Sadiq Very says. We need everything that we need to do. There's no disagreement there. Yep. Bakerloo line deal. We need all that stuff. The question is, how do you pay for that if you take 1.9 billion out of the budget? So but, but there is no, there is no one. There is not. I mean, there is not a single. There is, there is not a single transport expert, even in the Labour Party, who believes that his fares will, uh, uh, pledge will cost less than 1.9. There's no one. The TfL commissioner, the previous commissioner, Christian Woolmart okay. from the Labour Party, okay. everyone accepts 1.9 billion is what it would cost for you to deliver that pledge, yes, yes. and it would be catastrophic. Okay. It's just completely dishonest. 
not for the first time Zach's talking rubbish. The, the, commissioner of TfL, the Commissioner of TfL has said that my first freeze wouldn't impact investment in TfL. That's right. not true. Okay. He gentleman said the exact the, opposite. The gentleman in the middle here, and then the gentleman has got the mic up the back. Yes. Right. I'd like to remind Zach, um, who I've got a great admiration for, he did say in the Evening Standard, my play, the Anne Frank play was his favourite play. Oh, sorry. Just, to, oh, just right. to mention that, Zach. Uh, uh, my question is in two folds. The first one is, would you put London above party? Can you answer that first? Either one of you. No, no, you've only got you? one question. I'm sorry, there's a lot of people right. in here. That's right. your right. question. All right, if, sorry. if, no, 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 that's your question. Where's your question? That's your question. We had a, we had a question. Would you put London above party? I see. Of course. London above party? But my entire career as a politician has been about putting my constituents first. Right. Okay, gentlemen, up. <laughs> gentlemen with the microphone in the back quarter. Yes? Take. Yes, you, it's you. Taking you up on Con Crossrail 2. Is this working? Yes. yes. Uh, when Transport for London held a recent consultation about stations and route, Almost half the voices in response said, we don't want a station in Chelsea. Does Chelsea need regeneration? Does it need a billion pounds of public money wasted on the station there? Aren't there other parts of London requiring regeneration where it should be? And 90% of the locals said no to a station. Thank you. Zach Goldsmith. Are you prepared to make a public commitment I, I have against to a station Thank in Thank you Chelsea? very much. I have to answer that question in two ways. The first is that we need to win the arguments on Crossrail 2. It is non-negotiable in my view. It will add 10% capacity to London. It will help us solve the housing crisis. We're not there yet. This is not in the bag. We've had a down payment by the government, £80 million, but it's a pinprick in the context of the overall cost. We've got to win the arguments. We've got to secure the funding. We've got to plough on ahead. As we get closer to a proper green light, then there will be debates about lots of different areas. I was in Wimbledon just a few days ago talking to resident, uh, residents about their concerns about the effect of Crossrail 2 on Wimbledon Town Centre. I've spoken to campaigners, uh, you're probably part of the same organisation, who are opposed to proposals for uh, a Crossrail station in Kings Road in Chelsea. Um, the, it, it, Crossrail 2 is not just a transport issue, it is a regeneration issue. So if the effects of Crossrail is to damage an area, as current plans I believe would in, for example, Wimbledon, then it doesn't make sense. It has to be a regeneration program, project. Right. I agree with you, the premise of your question, which is the purpose of a major infrastructure project is to regenerate an area. I think the station at Chelsea as it currently stands is in the wrong place, we should review that. As is the station in Ballam rather than Tooting Broadway, as is the plans for the station in Wimbledon. There's a, there's a saying that planners have, which is uh, infrastructure uh, should come before housing or regeneration rather than the other way around, a prosperous area then infrastructure. It should be the other way around. I think you're right. There are so many concerns about uh, Chelsea. The next mayor really has to review that. Right. Yes, the woman there. Thank you very much. Um, hi. I'm Frances Scott from a campaign called 5050 Parliament. We're a cross-party campaign for better gender balance and more women at Westminster. Um, thank you. <laughs> How do our mayoral candidates think that politics at both a national and a local level can be more, made more attractive and accessible to women to ensure that our government draws upon the widest possible pool of talent and experience? The microphone coming forward to uh, actually the woman there with the spectacles on, third row down. Yes. Well, look, I'm a proud feminist. And I want to be a uh, feminist in uh, City Hall. I think, for example, what my party did with the All Women Shortlist was very, very uh, good. I was in charge of the campaign in London, Francis, at the general election. Uh, and uh, I made sure that uh, our candidates in winnable seats were women. 70% of candidates in uh, winnable seats were women. I just think, you know, that we can't have a situation where we've got a parliament that doesn't look like the society we seek to represent and make laws for. Half of our, more than half of our Assembly members are, are women uh, as well. So, for example, if tra the Transport for London Board uh, had more than four women, there are 16 members, only four are women, would they really have allowed the British Transport Police to get rid of a unit that deals okay. with uh, sex just, crimes I, on our public transport? Can I just transport? ask you about that? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just that, so you're actually demanding equality on Transport for London? Yeah, uh, and, and on my business advisory board, at least half the members right. of my Same business advisory you, board will be uh, uh, women. But also, I want a gender pay audit, which I'll do. I'll be the first mayor to have a gender pay audit in City Hall. Exactly. Uh, 
I, I, I don't support the idea of quotas because I don't think that's the way to achieve it, and particularly in relation to Parliament and MPs, which was the basis of your question. I want Parliament to look like the country that it serves, not just in terms of gender balance, but ethnically as well. But I think going down the quota route is, is difficult, and I think fundamentally people should be able locally to choose their own candidates. That's why I believe in open primaries. I actually believe that if we had more open primaries, if people were allowed to select their own candidates without parties imposing them upon local associations, then Parliament would look right. more like the country that it represents. In right. terms of City Hall, yes, of course, City Hall is a big direct employer. I will make sure that as that employer, as the boss, I will ensure that, that City Hall looks like the London that it is serving, from but an ethnic it's point of view, but also from a gender point of view. But very here's, here's, very here's, very Francis, here's the problem with the way Zach wants to do stuff. My daughters won't survive till they're 700, which is the number of years it will take for Parliament to look like our country if we carry on as we are. Open primaries, for so example, are a good thing. Yeah. But, you know, but, but, but look, we, we've got to make sure the playing field is level. If, for example, you're middle class, uh, you've got the skills, uh, you've got money, of course you can stand for a primary and win the seat. Of course you can go for selection to be an Assembly member, to be a mayoral candidate, or to be a member of Parliament. But society isn't fair, so we've got to help those who are underrepresented, they could be uh, women, they could be disabled, they could be minority communities, to make sure they, they're empowered to get to Parliament. Right. Patient, patient front row of the balcony next. Thank you very much. Uh, whichever one of you is elected will be only the third Mayor of London. Um, which, how will you use that important resource that is uh, your predecessors in order to make the best of your um, time and role as, uh, as Mayor? The role of your predecessor. So, Sadiq. Well, uh, you're right. The, 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 the Mayor of London, actually, in political terms, is in its infancy. Uh, we're in our nappies, and sometimes the way we behave, we, it looks like that as well. But, but, but look, At least you're there, both saying it. There are, there, are, look, there, there are things both Boris Johnson and Ken Limson did which were good, and some which were not so good. I think Boris Johnson has been really good. Uh, being a salesman for our city overseas and the trade missions that he's uh, done. I promise to build on those, although I can't promise to almost kill a 10-year-old trying to score a try in uh, Japan. Uh, I think where Ken Livingston was good is a relation to the green agenda and, and housing. It was him, actually, who went to Paris first and, and nicked the idea of the cycle hire scheme, uh, the congestion charge, uh, really, really important. Having buses that are environmentally friendly and accessible to disabled uh, Londoners. I think neither of them understood the power of mayor. The mayor has levers at his or her disposal given to him or her by parliament, but also is the pulpit of City Hall of persuasion, bringing people together. So my skills for Londoners, and I am pinching from Bill de Plasio in New York, there's no statute giving me the powers to do so, but I'll do so. Homes for Londoners, similarly. Energy for Londoners, uh, similarly. I can make sure I have an advisory board where at least half the people are women. I can make sure there's a gender pay audit. I can use the, the, the power of procurement to make sure if you don't do business with City Hall, annual budget at the moment of 17 billion, it's only going one way upwards, you've got to pay the living wage. Yep. You've got to make sure there are small companies in the supply chain. You've got to be a fair employer, which includes thinking about trade union representation, but also women uh, as well. That's the influence a good mayor can have on a city. Right. <laughs> How will Boris and Ken influence you? I, I think Ken effectively created the job. So without Ken, then I think Boris would have been a less effective man. I think that he was able to do things because of the infrastructure that was created by Ken. And I think we should pay tribute to Ken for having done that. I think Boris has been a superb man for having banged the drum for London in a way that very few politicians would have been able to. He was elected, if you remember, in 2008 when the storm clouds were over London. There was real anxiety. And almost single-handedly, he it restored confidence in London. He imbued the whole world with a sense of excitement, optimism, and confidence in our city. And I don't think anyone else could have done it. I think he was the perfect person for the job in 2008. And what they both showed us, a lesson which, which I have learned, is that to be an effective mayor, you need to be able to get a good deal from government. Ken was able to work with government, and Boris was able to work with government. A questioner over here, please. Yes? Okay. We all know how often you have shared that platform with many, with, excuse me, okay. with one of the most uh, radical imams in Britain, Sal Sal Suleiman Ghani. In addition of Look, many... Can I just ones. say, we have dealt with this. No, okay, no, no, no. The question is, 
he he was your your preacher at the Tuting Islamic Center. If you cannot root out extremism at your own radical mosque, why should we believe that you can root out extremism in the okay. London? I am afraid. Okay. Right. So, 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 so Suleiman Ghani was Suleiman Ghani was a preacher at one of the mosques in Tutin, and I meet the preachers from the churches, the temples, the gurdwaras, uh, and the mosque. This guy didn't help me in the 2015 election. He helped my opponent, Dan Watkins, from the Tory Party. This true. guy wasn't. This guy. This guy. This guy. You know, when I when I when I when, I, when I've been mentoring. Well, okay, hang on, I, hang on. You can, I, I, I'll just ask. I've got to answer the question. Yeah, you've though, answered the question. I just want to say, do you regret ever sharing a platform or no, being with him? No. I just listen. I don't. I, I, he's That's all a, I, he, he's, he's Kirsty. He's a local preacher at one of our mosques. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. And you know, and look, I, I'm the he person can... who was photographed with him in a selfie a few months ago, trying to help you ask him but, to help counsellors become Tory. But do you regret? Oh, Sadie Khan, for God's sake. Yeah. And I'll say this. Well, it's not a question for you, Zach, and, at the moment. And, and okay, but I have to answer this question. And I've and I've got a plan how we tackle extremism and radicalization. I've also got a plan how we keep us safe. So I'm the candidate who says we need, a, we need a major review to ensure our emergency services can respond to a terrorist incident. I'm the candidate who's saying neighborhood policing keeps us safe. The commissioner agrees with me, so do previous commissioners, which I think the government was wrong to cut money from the neighborhood police officers. I'm the candidate who's got a plan to ensure we have better integration. I'm the candidate yeah. who thinks we should be closing well, down let, the website. Let's just nail, can we just nail this and get rid of this? Bedrooms. Imam Suleiman Ghani opposes homosexuality and believes women should be subservient to men. Could you just tell us exactly, you obviously decry those things. Well, but this is, look, we've, we've fallen out, he doesn't like me, right. and, I helped him get, and I helped him be removed from the local mosque. Right. Okay. <laughs> Question here. Um, Question here. Um, Question. Um, how much will you raise mayoral council tax um, if you become the mayor? For both candidates. Zach. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I will freeze mayoral council tax for the four years. Look, we saw a massive hike under Ken Livingston, 153% over the eight years. We've seen a 10% cut under, but under Boris for the last eight years. I've pledged to freeze council tax for the full four years. And I can do that because I secured a deal with government to protect funding for the police. I can guarantee, I can guarantee, that we, I can guarantee that we will keep police numbers at least at 32,000. I believe we can go further, but I have not promised things in my manifesto that I'm not absolutely absolutely certain I can deliver. I will keep police numbers at 32,000 throughout the four years and I'll put 500 new police on the tube paid for by TFO. And I will do it without putting a penny on council. His, his, his. Here's one of the problems Zach has. Over the last six years, he supported a government who have cut 600 million pounds from the Met Police budget. Here's one of the problems, here's one of the problems Here's one of the problems that Zach has. Over the last six years, he supported a government which has led to 1,500 officers being lost from London. Here's one of the problems with... Will uh, you... Sorry. Will you just... We've got a lot of questions to get to. Will you freeze it? I'll keep count as, as low as I can. Will you but freeze it? But, no, but, but here's, here's why... Okay. Here's why... I can't no. well, let me ask the question, Kirsty. Here's, here's why you can't make a promise to freeze council tax without risking our security. Because if the, if the Chancellor comes back next year, or the year after, or the year after, Church. saying... If, Listen, just hang on. I think Sadiq Khan is answering the question. And he is saying, hang on, hang on. And to me, he's saying that he won't freeze it. So I, there you are. That's your yes or no. You I, won't freeze I it. I will keep it as long as I can, but I can't you promise to freeze it over the next four right. years. Question here, please. Can you, can you hear? If elected, what will you do to ensure the Metropolitan Police Service is accountable to the public? And when will you ensure they will wear body-worn cameras? So, the second question? Will you assure? When cameras. will you ensure they wear body worn cameras? Bo body worn cameras. Sadiq Khan. Yes, the second question. They've already ordered them. They'll be coming on stream pretty, pretty soon. I was at the Met Police today. Uh, and they'll, they'll be really important, not simply in you know, getting the confidence of the public. We police by consent. 32,000 officers can't by themselves keep a city of 8.6 million people safe. They rely upon us to come forward with intelligence, with information 
to help with prosecutions, to be witnesses. That means they need our confidence, which is why we need a police service looking mar far more like London than it currently does. London's population currently is, roughly speaking, 40% BAME, Black, Asian, minority ethnic. The Met Police Service is currently only 13 14% Black, Asian, minority ethnic. It's not good enough. And we've got to make a police service look more like the London she seeks to police. That means making sure we have a more neighbourhood police officers, which is really important. If there's a further cut in the Met Police budget from the government, because Zach Goldsmith promised a freeze, he's got no levers to bring more police officers into London. Zach Goldsmith. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't. The Chancellor could not, have been more, uh, could not have been clearer that the budget is protected for the next four years as a consequence of a deal I and my colleagues did, a, a deal to which Sadiq Khan played no part at all. The budget is protected for the next four years. Um, yes to cameras. It is already happening. It's in the pipeline, and it's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, we need the recruitment process to be broadened out. Um, uh, another area I'm afraid we're going to agree on is that the police need to look more like London. We have seen progress over the last eight years, but not enough. The police still do not look enough like the London that they serve, and uh, until that happens, trust levels will not be sufficiently high. Uh, I, I also believe that we do that the pendulum on stop and search has swung too far away from its use. There was a time where stop and search was overused, where communities felt that they are... So I'm looking up, but I have no idea where the question came from. I think it came... The, 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 I'm talking to the world. Um, there was a time when communities felt that they were being harassed by stop and search, and as a consequence, politicians chose to swing the pendulum away from the use of stop and search, and we saw a collapse in the amount that it was used. And I think we've gone too far, and the police now believe, and they tell me, and they tell the Home Secretary, that there are people now walking around London with a feeling of impunity. They don't believe they'll be stopped or searched. So I'd like to find that balance again. I'll back the police doing it, but it must be intelligence-led. If it's not intelligence-led, we'll end up in, back in the same place we were in right, before, okay. where communities feel Sorry, that they're I'm going to start it. There's a gentleman in a kind of halo of light there with a, with a microphone. Uh, that's you. Yes. <laughs> there you are. Suleiman. Uh, this is this question for Mr. Zach. Uh, how you can make sure, like, the media um, being controlled properly? Because we've seen as the media is being, like, very negative toward Muslim people in this country and ethnic minority. And uh, they've been very extreme. How you, how you can make sure, like, as a Muslim person, I live in the UK and I work and I study, how you can protect us from these uh, abusive media? Oh. You're talking about okay. the media. Yes, the media. Um, Thank you. Zach. Uh, I do think the media have a role to play, of course. Um, if, if, and, and I think the BBC, uh, apologies to our, 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 our moderator today, I think the BBC too often, if I understood your question correctly, the BBC too often will give platforms to people who do not represent uh, mainstream Muslim views, but perhaps because it's better blockbuster entertainment, perhaps because it's uh, more, uh, you know, it's good for the, for the numbers. But I think that when people like Anjem Chowdhury are given platforms, it hasn't happened recently, but there was a time when he was on the BBC relentlessly. I think that must have caused an unbelievable sense of anger among the Brit uh, Britain's and uh, Muslim communities. There's someone whose distorted version of Islam bears no resemblance to mainstream Islam in, in the communities. And I don't think that helps at all. But it's not all about the media. I don't believe there are enough figureheads within the Muslim communities, people who are, uh, 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 who put, are able to put themselves forward as people who can help challenge the, ide the ideology that is putting the, the security of London at risk. Uh, so, I, that I think it's an ironic applause, Zach. I think that's what that is. Okay. So Look, I mean, I, I think it's important for there to be more minority members of our society in positions of power and influence. That will encourage people to get involved in mainstream politics, get involved in civic society. I think language is important. Uh, you want to encourage people, for example, to put their head above the uh, parapet. I think I, li I like living in a society where we're challenged by the media as politicians. That's a good thing, because I visit countries around the world where politicians control the media. I can assure you that is a bad thing. Right. I'm going back upstairs. Man at the back. Hi. Um, so what are you going to do for tech startups in London? Boris has obviously been fantastic for it, so question for both. Tech, tech startups. startups. Boris has been fantastic for tech startups. What will you do? Sadiq. Uh, so we are on the neck and neck taking over New York as the world's lead, uh, who are second behind San Francisco in relation to the tech capital of the world. Lots of things we can do. I want to set up a Skills for Londoners. 
uh, Bill de Blasio had a tech talent pipeline. We need to train today's youngsters to have the skills of tomorrow. In particular, I worry too many school-aged children who are girls aren't being taught coding or website design. We've got to make sure young people and girls in particular, uh, because they're missing from the, the, the tech industry, have those skills. I'll have the, the first ever chief digital officer in City Hall. And we need to make sure when it comes to uh, new developments, we, we see uh, broadband as a fourth utility. We talk about water, we talk about gas, we talk about electric. What about ultra-fast uh, broadband? We're going to use a planning system uh, far, far uh, better. We need to have FTTP in relation to uh, internet going to premises. It's really, really important. We've also got to make sure the mayor goes to other parts of the world to get business for uh, London. Being a member of the European Union is great for the tech sector. Um, if I, I want City Hall to make better use of data. I mean, if you remember, um, the, there was a, the, the TfL spent years trying to create an app that would be user-friendly, that would enable people to get around London, know what bus to get, know what train to get, know how to, uh, for, how to, how to make the maximum possible use of the public transport network. And every time they produced something, it flopped. And then Boris Johnson and his team opened up data, uh, made data available to uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, digitally savvy young people wanting to tap into this extraordinary new sector that has emerged over the last 10 years. And within a matter of weeks, City Mapper emerged. City Mapper is something I better, I don't know how many people in this review, but I certainly do. And it's an extraordinarily valuable thing, so much better than anything that was created by TfL. So I want to have a more transparent approach. I'd like the City Hall to be much more open with its data. I'll also appoint a Chief Digital Officer. I think all the candidates in the mayoral uh, uh, contest have made that pledge on the back of very effective lobbying by Tech City. Um, but there is more we need to do, despite the record investment we see in, in our transport over the last eight years, the likes of which we haven't seen since the Victorian era. We're miles behind in terms of a broadband. Of the 33 top cities in Europe, we are currently languishing at number 26, and that is not acceptable. And it is a problem that can be solved relatively quickly, in part by using TfL's uh, extraordinarily expansive infrastructure, 560 kilometers. So we need a broadband for London to make London much better connected. Yeah, there's a question I know at the back here has been agitating. You've got the mic. You're right in the corner. Hello. Oh, hello. Hello. Um, one area we're not leading on is solar generation. <gasps> now, oh, thank you. <laughs> got a fan. Hooray. Um, what's concerning is, Sadiq, in your manifesto, you didn't actually mention about solar generation. And oh, solar. Um, Zach's you're saying that you're going to work more with central government, yeah. but you're going to have to defy them because they're basically shutting right. down solar generation on urban rooftops and killing off the feeding tariff to be financially right. viable. What can you do to increase solar in right. London? Zach Goldsmith. Um, thank you for that. And the, the, so the trade and just be quite quick because we want to get two or three more in. Okay, the trade bodies that represent the solar industry tell me um, that you can still achieve a 5% return despite the cuts. So it's not the end of the solar industry. Um, I do, solar has a massive, massive future in this country. What I will do, I will maintain the zero carbon homes requirement in London. I accept the government is rowing back on that, but the mayor can write that into the London plan. I will. I'll make developers of big sites include solar by default. So solar is incorporated into all new big developments. I like the mayor of Bristol, who has done some interesting things, but one of the things I like that he's done is he's made available publicly owned roof space to community energy groups. He said you can use it. If you want to use it for solar, go for it. There is no cost. And that has helped foster a, a, a revolution right. in solar uh, in Bristol, it, one that we can exceed very right, quickly no. here in London. Solar's got a massive future in London, and I'm going to back it all the way. City. It's worth, I mean, it's worth. It's worth reminding ourselves in case we forget the government cut the feed-in tariff uh, that, that was there before the support that they... No, they 98% of all no. solar in this country happened under this, under this well, government. Did, 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 98%. Right. It's just absolutely lovely. So, 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 the, government, yeah, the government cut the feed-in tariff. Yes, it right, did. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Because it had so, to. So one of the things if it hadn't, it would have been wiped out things, very quickly. It's, 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 it's mathematics. Which the companies objected to yeah. and, and, jobs, and jobs were lost. 
No jobs, jobs were lost as a result. No jobs, jobs were lost. Look, it's actually rubbish. This, the industry has flourished. Jo jo jobs were lost. It has flourished. And the progress made has been lost. So we need to set up in London energy for Londoners. What that will do is make sure we, for example, uh, use the community energy that's being created in parts of London. Why don't we bulk buy some of the clean energy being created in parts of London? Why don't we, we've, we've got, in, in Nottingham, Robin Hood do a great job there. And they, they sell it back. We should be doing that in uh, London as well. Smart metering is really, really important. Use public land to have solar energy being utilised, not simply in trials, but for London land. Think of all the public buildings in London that could be used for uh, solar energy. Right. We need local and clean energy. Right. The mayor right. can lead the way. Somebody asked, what could a mayor do? Don't simply rely upon the powers given to you by Parliament. You can lead an industry going from being, at the moment, where mediocre, as far as other cities are concerned, to being a world leader. Right. Now, I want to take a uh, not waving but drowning person up here, right at the front. Give you a question, please. Hi. Don't fall over the balcony. Hi. Um, I'm surprised to hear that you're a feminist, Sadiq, because I didn't hear the word woman before a question was asked. And I'm surprised to hear about the housing crisis without talking about women, because the highest proportion of homelessness applications in London <coughs> in terms of household types are lone mothers. Survivors of domestic violence are being sent to, north, to the north of England because there's no emergency accommodation in London. Is London not a city for all women that make up 50% of the population of London? Thank, Thank you. you. Sadiq Khan. Firstly, you're right, there are, there are, there are huge problems in relation to uh, women rough sleepers and women who are homeless. Uh, I, regularly come into my, I regularly have come into my surgeries uh, women have been rehoused an hour and a half away from where their children go to school and they've got to travel an hour and a half each way to get to school uh, which is a real problem if you've got children in more than one uh, school we've also seen uh, centers that help people who have women who are victims of domestic violence having their services cut over the last uh, few years so i will protect all the funding for the domestic violence centers that there are in london all the funding for going towards any violence against women and uh, girls but we've got to also help the, the police by making sure the, they, the, they know that the mayor's number one priority is the issue of uh, hate crime and crimes against women in uh, particular. Public transport, you will know, assaults against women has gone uh, up, which is one of the reasons why I felt so strongly that the British Transport Police were wrong to close down the special unit that's supposed to be addressed in this uh, issue. Police officers need to be using public transport far, far uh, more. I was, as, as an MP and a shadow uh, just secretary, uh, campaigning against the government's uh, uh, decision to cut legal aid for women who are the victims of uh, domestic uh, violence. By the, way, by the way, I'll let you guess which way Zach voted. Zach Goldsmith. Um, thank you very much. I, I will do whatever I can to reverse the decision by the British Transport Police to close the sexual offences unit. I just think it doesn't make any sense at all. I've already pledged to put 500 more police on our tube network. And that's where anxiety levels are very high. It's also where threats are very high, not just in relation to terror, but in terms of uh, violence against uh, women and girls. Um, I, I just, I look, I, I know society bashes the Tory this, Tory that, but the reality is that Theresa May and Boris Johnson between them have done, I think, more than any politicians before them to highlight and invest in preventing this issue through the crisis centres, the havens, the advocates throughout London to help women and girls who are at risk. And I think all of the organisations, and I've been lobbied very heavily by lots and lots of organisations, small and large, who are campaigning on these issues, pay tribute in each and every one of my meetings to the work that Boris and Theresa May have done. I'll build on that work in every conceivable way. On homelessness, the, the, the reality is that we are one of the most successful, prosperous cities in the world. We're the most important city in the world. It is not acceptable that 7,500 people are sleeping, are slept rough last night. It's just not acceptable by any standard, by any definition. I will take responsibility for that as mayor. Instead of leaving it to the local authorities who bicker with each right. other to avoid responsibility Enough. for individuals, refusing to take responsibility for individuals, I'll take that responsibility centrally right. and I'll uh, allocate on behalf of the local authorities and we will nail this right. problem. <laughs> on the basis that we leave you all wanting more and I'm afraid we're going to have to do the 90 second closing statements uh, from each of the two candidates here and the first is from Sadiq Khan. Thank you Kirsty. Firstly thank you all for being here to listen to us uh, this evening. London is the greatest city in the world but we are at a crossroads and Londoners face a clear choice. 
The Tories' Donald Trump campaign offers only fear, division and more of the same. Four more years without a solution to the housing crisis, a 17% hike in fares and opportunities continuing to narrow. But Londoners can make a different choice, a positive choice. You can choose hope, a city in which opportunity is increased, a city in which communities are united and come together to tackle the challenges we face. More genuinely affordable homes for Londoners. A more affordable and modern transport network and a city where Londoners are kept safe. With the Tory government in chaos more than ever before, London needs a mayor with the experience, the values and the vision to deliver. I will be that mayor, a one London mayor, a mayor for all Londoners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you, Evening Standard. Thank you to the sponsors. Thanks, everyone, for being here. The choice in this election is very, very clear. If you want council tax frozen, then back me. My opponent here has already acknowledged he will whack it up, like Ken Livingston before him, to pay for the promises that he's made for which there is no allocated funding. If you want investment in our transport infrastructure to keep London moving, to keep London growing, then back me. Sadiq Khan's flagship policy will strip £2 billion out of that budget, and the effect is that London will grind to a standstill. If you want those 50,000 homes that we need to solve the housing crisis to be built beautifully, to enhance communities, and without concreting over our, our precious green spaces, then back me. Sadiq is the last minister of any party, of any government, uh, to champion building on our precious green belt. And if you want London to be safe, then back me. I will always, always give the police the tools and the resources and the backing they need to keep us safe. This election will go right down to the wire. Every single vote will count not voting in this election is a choice and I urge you to give me your backing on May the 5th. You can do so knowing from my record as an MP that I will deliver for London. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. and taking part. Thank you to the Evening Standard and Centre for London and to the sponsors Gatwick and also in Midtown. Uh, please thank you once again to our two participants. And um, remember, vote early and vote often. Thank you very much. Well, hello and welcome back to London Votes with me, Daisy McAndrew. As we can see, the race to replace Boris Johnson as Mayor of London is well underway. We've just heard from the two front runners, Labour's Sadiq Khan and Conservative candidate Zach Goldsmith. Now, judging from everything you've been saying on social media, the tweets you've been sending us, well, the most popular person in the debate, I think, was Kirsty Walk for <laughs> moving on from that. There was, there was a lot of...